Hi friends, welcome to Islington United Church and this is July 2024 and our tech team is away for the next four Sundays and so we've picked four Sundays from July 2020. Amazing to think where you were four years ago and how much happens in a time span. We hope you'll enjoy this service and we hope that in the midst of its translation from one year to another that you'll find God's grace. And if you'd like to hear of the sermon that happened in the sanctuary, which wasn't streamed this Sunday at Stuart East Hall, then just check out the podcast at Islington Listens.
As we acknowledge the land this morning, let's start right where we are. I invite you to just pause and ground in this space, in this moment. Maybe take a breath, feel how your body is held here, how the force of gravity anchors you to this place. And now notice the land itself, how it supports us. We can consider some of the ways that the land nourishes us. We recognize that this land has been home to indigenous peoples for many thousands of years. They lived and thrived here long before European settlers came and drastically altered their lives and the life of the land itself. We are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. The light of Christ calls us to peace and justice in no uncertain terms. As the Gospel writer Luke says, to whom much has been given, much will be required. Those of us born into privilege have a responsibility to stand with the oppressed, just as Jesus did. And in the face of systemic racism in Canada and the many ways we perpetuate it, we are called to listen and learn, to challenge and change the status quo, and to make space for others. And so I pray that this light may remind us of our responsibility to an active and engaged peace, calling us to be vocal in spaces where it is not being equally shared. And that light extends a light of welcome. And we're glad that you are with us worshiping wherever you are. We hold space in this community for you to be yourself. We are a group of people not thinking the same, not voting the same, not loving the same, but trying together to follow in the way of Jesus. And this is the season of summer, the season of rest. In the city of Toronto, it's also the season of construction, and much is happening in our building right now. There have been windows just outside that are being replaced, that are moving from faded glass to clear glass, that lets us see differently, open into the community in a new way. And so we hold that space for you to worship as we praise God for this morning.
When we gather, we're aware that the cloud of witnesses is with us. And we light these memorial lights this morning, honoring those that you are remembering, those who have touched your lives, shared with you their gifts, who have called out of you the gifts that you didn't even know you had, but they noticed, they named them. We hold space for the ways that those gifts live in us and are shared with our community. And we pray that God will continue to open our hearts and our minds to hear that call. Our scripture story comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verses 10 to 19. We meet Jacob along the road. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed 
that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have promised. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Bethel, house of God. That's what Jacob calls this place, this place where he laid his head on a rock to sleep. This place where he dreamed and saw angels ascending and descending a ladder from heaven to earth. The words of prophecy first given to his grandfather are echoed here. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. But looking at Jacob and the journey he's been on, I find myself wondering, why is God speaking to him in a dream? Why is Jacob gifted with a prophetic vision? Isn't he on the run from his brother, who he just cheated out of his inheritance? Our third week into the summer series on spiritual gifts brings us today to the gift of prophecy, perhaps one of the more mysterious spiritual gifts. We've certainly had it built up over time, imagining it to be far out of reach, an ancient gift that no longer shows up here anymore. Or maybe it even seems undesirable, a gift we wouldn't want. Maybe we picture people going into trances and chanting, quivering intensely as they channel wisdom from beyond. But perhaps it's more accessible than that. Maybe we don't have to set up a 1-900 number and open up a psychic hotline to exercise the gift of prophecy in this time and place. A prophet is a forth teller, someone who sees a broader view and speaks about it. Someone who knows a bit about history, witnesses present occurrences, and can see the bigger picture, often forecasting the trajectory of life in a given time and place. Some describe a prophet as someone with a balcony view. They bring us instruction and warning, calling us to correct our course. Through the lens of our series on spiritual gifts, we can look at prophecy as the gift of word pointing us toward deeds, the gift of wisdom making a path for action. And sometimes we can more easily discern prophecy when we know what it's not. A prophet is not someone who makes a big deal of themselves, looking for attention. 
Their work and their words may well bring attention, but it's a byproduct, not a focus, and certainly not a need. Someone more invested in getting something from you than giving something to you, again, is probably not a prophet. This kind of charlatan is often identifiable by their worldliness, and they're usually very self-serving. They're of the world. Perhaps you can think of some. And our intuition can see through otherwise impressive facades, maybe even inspiring facades. And it's our opportunity to make space to listen to our own inner wisdom, to discern the prophetic words in our midst, and to know those words that are not. In his book, Let Your Life Speak, activist and author Parker Palmer suggests that because most leaders who seek public office are generally extroverted, they are not as frequently tuned into this type of inner listening and discernment. And thus they become more easily swept away by the worldly voices and vices, serving greed instead of feeding the needs of people. It's therefore important for us to seek out leadership on the fringes, or perhaps step into such roles. After all, Jesus himself was a fringe leader. He called us to follow him. And over the centuries, as Jesus moved from the fringes and became an increasingly central figure in our culture, his message was frequently co-opted, even corrupted, by worldly leaders driven more by self-interest than service and self-giving. But again, we have truth detectors embedded in our hearts. We also have BS detectors, and they can do good work for us. Because the voice of truth, the voice of prophecy, is within us. We don't have to go looking for it in the world. When we hear a prophetic word, it will resonate as truth, however subtly and however quickly our minds might snap into doubt and judgment. And so, even though it is simple on one level, the gift of prophecy is not always black and white. Obviously, it's not always clear-cut. In fact, it's often fuzzy, coming in from the edges, approaching in obscurity, almost sneaking up on us. It comes in dream, sometimes in vision. And this is perhaps partly why it garners such a sense of mystique. But I hope that you don't think you lack this gift just because you haven't been struck by lightning bolts of clarity or divine inspiration. Like Jacob, we often stumble into prophecy. Fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esau, whom he just cheated out of his inheritance, Jacob is on the move, on the run, actually. And in her sermon on the text, Barbara Brown Taylor observes that Jacob is on no vision quest. He has simply pushed his luck too far and has left town in a hurry. He is between times and places in a limbo of his own making. And which of us hasn't found ourselves in a limbo of our own making? But God can find us in these moments of limbo, between times and places. Moments of pandemic, perhaps. We can stumble this way into God's presence. Our path to prophecy doesn't have to fit any fixed image. Jacob had a bit of a checkered past, but God reached out to him anyway. A minister from the United Church of Christ, our partner church in the United States, Catherine Matthews, notes that God reaches Jacob in that limbo, that unplace, just as God can meet us with words of wisdom and comfort in unexpected places. She says, Our colorful history and misdeeds matter not one bit when God decides to call, or better, when God comes looking for us, perhaps even pursuing us. The path behind Jacob is closed. The path ahead is unclear. And so he is present. This is where we listen, right now. Our work is listening. God is already speaking to us and speaking our language. That's right. The voice of God knows how to speak your language. 
whether in words or otherwise. God speaks the language of your own heart. And if you're willing to believe this is possible, or even if you're willing to not disbelieve, this is enough for God's voice to reach you. Learning to notice this voice is relatively easy. But as we see again and again in the Bible, learning to trust it can be the hard part. Jonah, Gideon, Jeremiah, all reluctant prophets. Even Moses put up a fight when God called, full of excuses. Learning to honor and obey the voice of prophecy can be incredibly difficult. I won't sugarcoat it. But that voice of prophecy rests inside all of our hearts. It's not only given to special individuals. Granted, we might have a natural leaning toward another gift and thus foster other strengths. But this gift is planted in all our hearts. We all have the capacity to pay attention to God's vision for us. And years ago, when I was cycling around Europe and looking for my own path, I framed it this way, and I found it helpful at the time. I wanted to listen for the voice of the universe and not be drowned out by the voices of the world. And I saw the voice of the universe as God's voice planted within. Now, obviously, we need to keep an ear open to the world to know the needs and the language of our siblings and how to connect. But we don't want to take our guidance from the world alone. If it gets too much of our attention, the world will confuse us, convincing us to chase money and twisted visions of success at the expense of others, not to mention our planet. But with an ear to the world and a deeper listening to that universal voice within, we can attune to the gift of prophecy, the gift of a broader view, and being attentive to the voice of the universe, which is our deeper self, we are given the courage to speak the truth that we sense within. In the book of Acts, we see Peter speaking prophecy, challenging the lies of Ananias and Sapphira, boldly reminding people of God's call on their lives. More recently, we can raise up an example like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Thoughtfully and intelligently, Dr. King challenged corrupt power structures and those defending them. Speaking out on freedom, nonviolence, and civil rights, he was driven to seek justice and equality for all, a cause in as much need of support today as it was then. I feel the voice of prophecy alive in other ways today, perhaps in unexpected ways, in some of our TV hosts like Stephen Colbert, a devout Catholic, or through other comedy news, like The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, or Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. These people are speaking truth to power, challenging corruption, looking with a broad view at the circumstances of the world, with the insight of history and an eye to the horizon, trying to correct our course. And if they seem a bit foolish, Maybe that's just them stumbling into wisdom, a bit like Jacob, not fitting the image of a prophet and yet open to God's wisdom, God's voice. And it helps that they're offering a laugh, a spoonful of sugar, alongside so much news that is utterly laughable, a world at odds fighting over scraps instead of seeking the home of God within. Earlier this week, Jason reminded me of a song from La La Land, a song about fools who dream. And it feels appropriate here, showing how the voice of prophecy brings new life into our world by trusting our inner voice and not trying to fit in. A bit of madness is key to give us new colors to see. Who knows where it will lead us? And that's why they need us. So bring on the rebels, the ripples from pebbles, the painters and poets and plays. And here's to the fools who dream, crazy as they may seem. Here's to the hearts that break. Here's to the mess we make. And yet, amidst all the mess, all the traffic, all the noisy voices in the world, there is 
a shrine of quietness within. God's ever-living presence, the voice of the universe, open to all of us at all times. As Jacob himself says, surely the Lord is in this place. Yes, God is calling us to this stillness. Whether we stumble or bumble our way home, God is willing us to slow down and notice our own ground, God's ground, the ground of being. Amen. Mid all the traffic of the way, turmoil without within, making my heart a quiet place and come and dwell therein. A little shrine of quiet sacred to thyself, where thou shalt all my soul possess, and I may find myself. shelter from life's stress where I may lay me prone and bear my soul in loneliness and know as I am known.
Let us pray. In the stillness, O God, we sense the power of the Spirit that grounds us in your being. We give thanks this morning for the forth tellers, the creatives, the ones willing to stumble and try to speak. Forgive us when we ignored them, when we didn't listen when we refuse to be silent. This morning, we honor the gift of prophecy, that those amongst us see and listen clearly. Their words move us to action. Their wisdom calls us to deeds that change the world. Awaken us this morning to the detectors in our hearts. Paying attention to truth. We listen. We listen well. And when we listen well, we're aware of who we listen to. This morning, God... We pray for those who are weary and worn out, those who are grieving and sick, those in limbo. And in their speaking, may we make room for wisdom of experience, knowing the risk it takes to tell and share the truth. And God, we thank you for Jesus who embodied this gift, who recognized it in others, and who invited us into that practice. He's also the one who taught us to pray together, who loved us like a mother and walks with us like a brother. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Often in the church, when we listen to the voices on the margins, we are invited into ways of knowing. And when we offer our tithes and gifts to the ministry of Islington United, we're connected to the wider work of the United Church of Canada. And as you hear this story of healthy babies in Gaza, I invite you to consider the ways that you're giving generously and offering to this work that makes a difference in our world. It's hard to be a child in Gaza. But in the midst of this harsh life, there are places that offer gentle support for children and parents. This clinic is one of three operated by the Middle East Council of Churches in Gaza. It monitors the health of 22,000 children annually, as well as providing pre- and postnatal care for mothers, dentistry services, and a range of psychosocial support for children. Children are measured and weighed at each visit. When they are sick, the clinic can supply medications that they need from the stock available. And for 38% of the children, iron supplements to treat their chronic anemia, caused by the lack of affordable, nutritious food. Gaza is a war zone. Under blockade, 
and locked in by Egypt and Israel in a cycle of attack and counterattack in the ongoing conflict rooted in the wider occupation of the Palestinian territories. Here, civilians are always in the line of fire. But there are small respites. In a building beside the clinic, there is a satellite program where these girls meet, dance, have fun, and remember how to laugh together. The work of the clinic and the Middle East Council of Churches' other programs in Gaza are vital to people's mental and physical health. Thank you for your gifts and please continue to support the mission and service of the United Church of Canada. Thank you for being part of work that matters. Thank you for giving virtually on our website or offering an e-transfer to office at islingtonunited.org or dropping off checks or placing them in the mail that allow us to explore together what the world's being called to and where the forth telling is happening. We're making our way together and I'm grateful for your place in that way. There's much happening online in our ministry. There's much happening in action as we give thanks for the ways that our children and family coordinator is partnering with Youth Without Shelter and making sure that those connections are caring for youth in our city at this time. We're also grateful that Michelle reminds us that Jesus is with us wherever we go. And she's shared this PDF and you'll be able to print it out and color your own Jesus. It's a blank slate so you remember um, how you take him with you wherever you go. And we'll be gathering photos of our community where this prophet shows up, where you notice him. And so stay tuned for more of that story to come. We are grateful for this summer season, the chance to rest and to listen well. We do that as we invite Jesus to keep teaching us each day how to use our lives for the mending of this world and the sharing of this inclusive love. Let's sing together our closing hymn.
Go from this place surrounded by the unconditional love of God and following in the way of the one who spoke and risked for love. And may in your listening, you be empowered by the Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.